Katie Vicellio, and my talk is uh, titled Specular Realism. I spent the first 14 years of my adult life work working in lighting design for theater and television. My undergraduate degree is in theater, and this was my, the field of my first design training. My professor, Dr. David Nankaro, said that in theater, if the audience is paying attention to the lights, the lighting designer has done something wrong. If the lighting design calls attention to itself, the illusion is shattered and the audience will be taken out of the experience. This theatrical experience should be cohesively integrated so that it removes the spectator from the parts and the orchestrated whole transports the viewer through storytelling to reveal a greater truth on stage. This is a fundamental idea of Western theater, which has its roots in the Dionysian cults of pre-ancient Greece. The primary principle of these initiations was of possession and atavism, resulting in a sharp regression to the primitive, the unintelligible, the source of being, by surrendering their civilized, individual, human identities through the power of the cult, if only for a moment, initiates might make contact with the divine. The Dionysian cults evolved into masked rituals laying the groundwork for theater as we know it today. I understood what Nankaro meant, but it also meant that no one would ever notice my work or give me credit. Throughout my career, audiences would praise a powerful performance, a thrilling script, decadent costumes or inventive scenery but the physical means by which these are revealed is usually missed, even by critics and other practitioners who should know better. I brought others to life with light, but spent my career in the dark. I moved into television, earning a coveted job working in lighting direction for a well-known show, allowing me the financial freedom to choose my theater projects, but even then, I felt I wasn't growing anymore, at least not the direction I had hoped. And worse, I had lost something more essential. I could no longer go to a show of any kind without scrutinizing the lighting elements, which meant I could no longer lose myself in the play. Leonard Cohen writes, as our eyes grow accustomed to sight, they armor themselves against wonder. In 2009, I went to Barcelona and took a tour of a strange building that stirred something inside me, something I didn't know was sleeping. I had no preconceptions. I knew nothing of architecture. I experienced space as a true innocent, suddenly immersed in awe, moved to a state of utter, unadulterated powerlessness. I was overcome by feelings of happy insignificance and an unexpected blissful acceptance of my smallness in the universe. It was in this moment that I changed the course of my creative life. I left light for architecture, not yet realizing just how deeply they are entwined. Gideon says, the evolution of space conception and our architectural inheritance make up the enveloping force of all nature, and he calls architecture an independent living organism with a beginning, middle, and end. In the poetics, Aristotle reminds us that drama, too, exists in space and time. Space and time are, in fact, the tools of the dramatist. And then, in comparing a play to an independent organism, Aristotle writes, a beautiful object, whether it be a living or any whole, composed of parts, must not only have an orderly arrangement of parts, a beginning, middle, and an end, but must, but must also be of a certain magnitude, for beauty depends on magnitude. Hence, a very small animal organism cannot be beautiful. For the view of it is confused, the object being seen in an almost imperceptible moment of time. Nor again can one of vast size be beautiful, for as the eye cannot take it all in at once, the unity and sense of the whole is lost for the spectator. A certain magnitude is necessary, and a magnitude which may be easily embraced in one view. Central to Aristotle's idea of beauty, of magnitude, is sight. And of course, vision does not exist without light. The role of light with respect to space and time in the theater is to direct focus, to mask, to enhance the storytelling, to find spatial relationships, and to suggest the passing of time. The role of light with respect to space and time in architecture is more elusive. The assortment of tools at an architect's disposal seems infinite, yet daylight seems to be the material all architects have in common. It has a presence in almost every built project, and its physical makeup is the same for every site, varying only in angle, color, and intensity. Still, light is also the material that many architects find the most mystifying. By touch, smell, taste, or sound, architecture can be discovered and appreciated in parts. But the sense of sight is the indispensable tool by which the space of architecture is experienced as a whole, which speaks to Aristotle's ideas of beauty and magnitude. Not only does light reveal architecture in space, it can appear to create another dimension of space, as in James Turrell's Afro. From the early Greeks, we get an idea about sight called the emission theory. 
which posits that sight is the result of light rays emitted from the eyes. Our eyes burned a fire lit by Aphrodite, turning the eye into a kind of lantern. We've moved beyond emission theory, but what really interests me here is the idea that, for quite some time, it was believed that light wasn't something we received, it was something we produced. By extension, we saw light as something that was under our control. Shut our eyes, and the world goes black. The authorship of light brings me to Louis Kahn, who sees the light as something we can't own. Marvelous in a room is the light that comes through the windows of a room and belongs to the room. The sun does not realize how beautiful it is until after a room is made. A man's creation, the making of a room, is nothing short of a miracle. Just think that a man can claim a slice of the sun. So in architecture, an architect can not only practice with the most powerful and constant light source, sunlight, he can be revered for it. Let's compare toolboxes. This is an ellipsoidal reflector spotlight. As light bounces from a reflector through the lens tube, it must pass through two lenses that are spaced apart so the light landing on the surface can have a focusable hard or soft edge. If we consider the light cannons in a section of Fermini, we can see what is much like a lens tube. How the light, passing from entry point to exit point, focuses the daylight to a hard edge when it lands on a surface. To the left is a theater ellipsoidal spotlight. To the right is the light cannon at Fermini. Because of its optics, a spotlight or light cannon cuts through other softer washed light and creates a crisp highlight that pulls its, sub its subject into the foreground and tells us where to look. Light cannons at Le Corbusier's La Tourette pull focus to the altars in the crypt in this way. Ellipsoidal spotlights are also used to, cr to create washes of patterns. Because the duality of the lenses allows for a sharp or soft focus, inserting a gobo or a template is a way of creating any number of textures, from starlight to industrial shadows to dappled light falling through imaginary trees and more abstract patterns. A pattern is placed after the light source's first focal point and before the lens tube, and blocks the light as dictated by the metal or glass template. Jean Nouvel's Arab Institute features a wall of irising metal templates that act as a wash of patterns to break up and incandesce the specular floor as the sun washes through and more to animate the figures of people passing through. Note how up close to the facade on the left of the image, the patterns are sharp for having just passed through the layers of the wall and how much more diffuse the light becomes as it has to travel farther and end at a more distorted angle. Similar to this is a cookie a flag that can be placed in front of any light with a simple pattern cut out. <clears throat> the Gabion wall at Herzog and Dumeron's uh, Dominus Winery acts in a similar way. With simple fencing sandwiching the thick stones, light passes through a rock's cookie onto the interior of the building. The tectonic reward for both the Arab Institute and the Dominus Winery is the clarity with which we understand the source of the dabbling effect by the nakedness of the technique. There is no hidden device manufacturing patterns off camera. Nothing is engaged in the effect except sunlight and its displayed interference. Here we have a bounce card. This reflects or scoops the light hitting its flat or curved surface and sends it in a new direction. More diffuse now, mixing the light's existing color temperature with the hue and surface quality of the bounce material. Kazuyo Sejima's Villa in the Forest employs a large round light well and circular exterior walls with strategically placed windows to reflect daylight softly around the smooth white surface texture of the space. In this image, we are in the villa's light well. See how the sky acts as a giant blue bounce card, bringing a coolness through the top of the building that's bounced around the white walls and the floor. It contrasts with the sharp, bright warmth of the direct light from the windows. The light effects in Stephen Hall's St. Ignatius Chapel are produced using a simple extension of this method. By backpainting planes that are removed a short distance from the walls, the walls are splashed with a reflected hue, creating an interplay of silhouettes and washes of color. In the bottom left image of the chapel's exterior, one can see those backpainted planes as they directly face the portals of light. In theater, the term practical refers to a prop or a scenic element of any design that requires power, usually a light. When lit, it can create such a powerful image within the scene that it all but becomes a character itself. The Nelson Acton's Museum of Art block building edition, designed by Stephen Hall, acts, acts as such a practical. By day, it rests in the landscape with deference to the principal museum and a supporting role. At night, when illuminated, the building doubles over the Walter de Maria lights, peeking through the reflecting pool, upstaging the principal and stealing the scene. 
The light fixtures sandwiched in the translucent and transparent glass exterior walls, much as a lighting designer might use a light box for a theatrical moon, render the chorus of buildings serene and figural, a series of grounded moon lanterns that seem to take on a different scale, causing the night sky to recede. See how the lanterns, or lenses as it were, become a theatrical cyclorama and make a screen of dwarfed bare trees. There are countless analogies between the disciplines, and studies like these opened a big window into how I might begin to take skills I'd already honed and put them to work in a new medium. But books and images are no substitute for the real thing, especially when it comes to sunlight. And so, to move from theory into practice, I did what any self-respecting architecture student would do. I went to Rome. Last May, I did a two-week independent study to explore light strategies in canonical architecture, and I made a discovery. I measured the light in several buildings. I photographed, diagrammed, and tried to capture the light in the Pantheon and Santivo, among others, with specific focus on the hours of 9 a.m., noon, and 4 p.m. And here's Santivo. The light output measured in foot candles was shockingly different from one building to the other, and the extremity of this forced me to question traditional values of measurement, like the IES standards, as well as the methods of surface treatment and related cultural contexts. In the Pantheon at 12.55 p.m., the darkest part of the interior measured 24.9 foot candles, and the light streaming from the oculus landed on the entrance measuring 7,610 foot candles. That's a difference of 7,585 foot candles. At Borromini's Santivo, built over 1,500 years later and still lit by daylight, the difference from the lowest light at 4.06 foot candles to the brightest at 5.83 measured only 1.73 foot candles. This means that the brightest point of Santivo measured a fifth of the illuminance of the darkest point in the Pantheon, and yet somehow the evenness of its light made Santivo feel brighter. The curved monochromatic surface acts as a softbox in Santivo lending a continuity of illumination unusual to Baroque interiors, resulting in a welcome quietness, a calm that encourages the eye to wander and meditate. If the scale of the chapel, small in plan but vast in height, had been realized with the typical exuberance of Baroque's ornamental colors and materials, the character of the space would completely change. The evenness would be gone, the windows appearing smaller, farther away, more inaccessible, and more in line with the usual melodramatic Baroque ex execution of objectives heightened tensions, opulence and power, rather than the meditative quietness we find in the absence of color and shine. When the light from the Pantheon's oculus hits the interior of the dome, the vastness of the dome reads as somber and gray. The light is more evenly distributed than it is at noon when the beam strikes the entrance. The transformation that hour brings is disconcerting. Despite the ideal spherical interior, the directionality of the light source distributes its light surprisingly unevenly. The contrast of 7,500 foot candles renders the viewer blind and lost upon entry, as if the heavens are striking us with all the force of its divine power. On April 21st, the anniversary of Rome's founding, the midday sun hits a grill above the door, bathing the shaded outdoor colonnade courtyard in light. And using the colonnade to understand light's role again brings us to a useful observation from Louis Kahn. The column is where the light is not, and the space between is where the light is. It is a matter of no light, light, no light, light. A column and a column brings light between them. To make a column which grows out of the wall and which makes its own rhythm of no light, light, no light, light, that is the marvel of the artist. Marvel is found in the interplay of darkness and light. Kahn designed through shadow, not so much the presence and absence of light, but its interference. My background in lighting offers a lot in terms of how I might begin my own work, but these studies raise deeper questions of cultural meanings and the implications embedded in the, in the cuts of the building. So what is the as intended aesthetic effect? In theater, the conventional end game is the Aristotelian notion of catharsis, a purging of emotions, resulting in a kind of purification. In witnessing the suffering of others on the stage, we are better able to identify, understand, and cleanse ourselves of our own sufferings. Hamlet's advice to the players warns, or step not the modesty of nature, for anything so overdone is from the purpose of playing, whose end, both at the first and now, was, and is, to hold as were, the mirror up to nature. By nature, Shakespeare means, of course, human nature. The theatrical event is the mirror. To watch it is to watch ourselves. 
carry this idea into the contemporary, and we begin to find some resonance with Jacques Lacan's psychoanalytic development theory, known as the mirror stage. To perhaps oversimplify, an infant sees an image in the mirror and begins to identify with that image. At some point, the infant experiences what Oprah calls an aha moment, grasping the connection between the image and its own existence. The image now has meaningful form. This form is what Lacan calls the eye. It's important to note that the eye is actually external to the child. It comes into being only as the result of an encounter with an other, something outside of ourselves. So even after our individual identity has been firmly established in childhood, we continue to depend on others for our coherence of that identity. 500 years after Aristotle, another treatise attributed to Longinus was composed on emotional responses to art on the sublime. After years of hearing the term sublime thrown around in architecture school, it can still be a slippery term. If it's an aesthetic goal of architecture, I should try to define it for myself. As it's used in the essay, the word sublime is a translation, using the Latin word sublimus to stand in for the author's actual word of choice, ecstasis. There is a difference, probably an important one. Sublimus, uplifted, lofty, and exalted. Ecstasis, to, to be or stand outside oneself. About ecstasis, Longinus writes, it does not convince the reason of the reader, but takes him out of himself. That which is admirable ever confounds our judgment and eclipses that which is merely reasonable or agreeable. He describes ecstasis, or ecstasy, as a lightning flash that transports us to a state of wonder, awe, and otherness. It is transformational, if only for a moment, leaving us in a place beyond the limits of our own understanding. And maybe here we find some common ground with the sublime. Used as a verb, sublime means to convert, as from a solid to a gas, or from earthly to empyrean. Related is the psychoanalytical concept of sublimation, the conversion of base impulses into those of a higher aim. So in order to cross the threshold, to move beyond earthly considerations, to be uplifted, one must first stand outside oneself. So catharsis is about finding yourself. The sublime is about losing yourself. One of the most famous examples of this kind of involuntary conversion is in Euripides' play, The Bacchae. Dionysus comes to Thebes, seeking revenge on the city for its refusal to worship him. As punishment, the god whips the town's women into a literal bacchanalian frenzy, sending them into the mountains to partake in the cult rituals. By the end of the play, the rigidly Apollonian king Pentheus is torn apart by his own possessed mother, Agave, and as a final sucker punch, Dionysus sends Agave into exile. We mortals aren't able to possess the populace at will, however hard we may try. Instead, we must find a way to create a threshold and persuade others to cross it. But how, as architects and artists, can we get people to do this, to step outside of themselves, if only for a moment, to see themselves not only as individuals, but as a part of something much bigger than themselves? In architecture, perhaps this threshold can be found in considerations of materiality. These issues of materiality have been explored in the work of artists in the light space movement, which had a decidedly architectural and sometimes theatrical footing, and is experiencing a bit of a renaissance with the recent work of James Terrell, one of its founding members. While the popularity of Terrell's sky spaces, at and rain, and curiosity about his road and crater project have brought the light and space artists back into the art conversation, his earliest studies proved the most groundbreaking. In this early work, Terrell references his use of light from one projector pointed at a corner to challenge our perceptions of the three-dimensional. With Aphrom, the first thing that is important is that the light is used as a material, and that it has a physical presence as such, and that space is solid and filled and never empty. By making cuts and angling the edges of boundary, he is able to erase the glare one would expect to find where a wall meets a plane of light. In illustrations and aquatint prints, Terrell shows the specificity with which he was examining both effects and atmosphere of single source projections through multiple methods. Artists Dan Graham and Larry Bell have both worked in the realm of light space using large sculptures of reflective transparent or reflective translucent glass that interrogate a viewer's awareness of himself and his neighbors on many complex levels. Graham, in particular, works with these in a frame, which reminds us that we are looking at and through an object. The frame is presentational, and so reinforces the simplicity of the structure, making it playful. The ideas of man-made mirror and play once again brings to mind the mirror stage theories of Jacques Lacan, as he describes a child gazing into a mirror, playing, his arms waving in jubilant activity. This jubilant assumption of his specular image by the child, 
would seem to exhibit in an exemplary situation the symbolic matrix in which the I is precipitated in a primordial form before it is objectified in the dialectic of identification in the other. These embodied meanings within Bell's and Graham's glass materials invite architects and others to consider the inherent perceptual issues and questions raised by the immediacy of being confronted not only with oneself, but perhaps simultaneously with the other. For my most recent studio endeavor, I chose the Folly Competition because of the theoretical roots in the kind of Dionysian Apollonian conflict we find in Euripides Bacchae, establishing order and chaos in the meeting of citadel and garden. In the competition, I set out to establish a conflict, a dialogue between two vastly different materials mediated by light. In the center of the folly, the visitor is framed by two mirrored but opposing strategies. One corner is concrete with cuts to harness, hide and reveal the light of the sun as it crosses the folly over the course of the day. The opposite corner is the same shape as the concrete but made of semi-reflective glass. In this corner, the viewer encounters a reflection through two layers of differently angled glass, a ghosted image of himself in the far panel, and a surprising absence of reflection in the nearest panel. At the same time, he gets a peek into the world beyond the panels at those positioned on the other side, who in turn are only able to see a hint of the figure watching them. This moment in the project tries to pick up where Dan Grant's questions of awareness left me in my research. I constructed a small abstracted model to study different materials in sunlight, testing the interaction of morning, morning light striking both patterned opaque pieces and solid reflective refractive pieces in orthogonal relationships including a reflective transparent floor and two layers of movable rear walls. The simple model clarified my understanding of the subtle variations of reflectivity and the ghosting effect when one sees another form positioned beyond one's own reflection, but still were too small to reap the benefits of full-bodied reflections and transparencies. And as the obscure critic Jeffrey Michael Kipnis reminds us, you can't scale a photon. Aristotle would agree with him. It's a problem of magnitude. We find similar problems in drawings, renderings, and other representations. The effects of reflection and refraction can be calculated with enough material specification, but environmental questions and experiential moments dependent upon the individual viewer are limited in pre-production and difficult to predict. Investigating this kind of work requires a certain magnitude of study, budget, and material access. And then there was another problem. What began for me as an exploration of materiality and its requisite change in tactics became a question of purpose. The primary criticism of my project in studio was that the directed outcome was undefined. I hadn't quite articulated a specific goal. So experimentation without end actually does have its limits and presents a dilemma. So is order the key to giving the user the desired aesthetic outcome? Can a specified emotional response only be achieved through a scripted direction of experience? Sanov's use of glass boundary in the 21st Century Museum manages to push past questions of awareness to actually create a kind of clarity through order. Volumes are revealed and denied through clear geometrically defined transparencies that are so meticulously detailed as to nearly disappear. The clarity of Sanov glass is almost Apollonian, inclined toward objectivism or realism. The user can see where they want to go. Sometimes they can get there directly, but often they must look to the map of the building's idealized composition to find their way to the destination, a destination they can see right in front of them. These spaces are closed off, separated by subtle formal boundaries of glass. Complexity in circulation and clarity of views are interwoven in this rewarding order of very basic shapes. But there may be also problems with this kind of control and authorship of the experience. On a recent trip to Japan, I encountered, among others, the new master of light on concrete to Dalondo. Here's the chapel of the Church of Light. See how the simple cuts make a powerful statement behind the altar, so powerful that no ornament is needed to indicate purpose. Seeing the place in person, however, was a little disappointing. Ando strikes a dynamic chord with this bold iconographical gesture, revealed immediately upon entrance to the chapel. So now what? This image, born in an intersection of materials, abundant daylight, and smooth concrete, is a pretty literal translation of the program, without much else to gain from the rest of the building. It's like the ending of the movie revealed in the trailer. It's kind of a letdown. Iconography such as this speaks to our Apollonian side, giving us a prescriptive money shot rendering in a web search. It seems as if Ando is taking a kind of shortcut to the sublime experience. It's giving us an answer to the question, and here, with its unambiguous cross, the answer is pretty obvious. An extreme and far more dangerous shortcut to the sublime was attempted by Albert Speer. 
Nazi Germany offers us possibly the most extreme example of collective sublimation in recent history. After World War I, the Nazi party saw an opportunity to gather and redirect the collective anger of a broken nation. As a visual and spatial representation of German supremacy, Albert Speer used a line of over 130 searchlights in the Nuremberg Zeppelin field to mark the closing ceremonies of the Nazi rallies. This created the Cathedral of Light. The use of this effect was reported on propaganda films in the 30s and 40s. Beyond the pageantry and the rhythmic columns of light, light far more powerful than what most people at the time were used to seeing, it positioned the people in Valhalla itself, the Hall of Norse Gods, where Odin invites the bravest of fallen warriors to commune with the divine for eternity. In the same film, flooded light on marching troops casts enormous ghostly shadows on the buildings they pass. Their power becomes more than pageantry. By the light, it seems as if the buildings themselves, again, a figurative Valhalla, are inhabited by the ghosts of Germany's fallen. In the early Dionysian rituals, Dionysus gave his followers torches to carry up the mountain to worship and enact his rites. A compilation of classical quotes provides a window into the ritualistic processions to the mountain from town. Following the torches as they dipped and swayed in the darkness, they climbed mountain paths with head thrown back and eyes glazed, dancing to the beat of the drum which stirred their blood. In this state of ecstasis, they abandoned themselves, dancing wildly and shouting, Evwe, the god's name, and at that moment of intense rapture, became identified with the god himself. They became filled with his spirit. The similarities are clear. In the actual video, you hear the drums and the chants, although in this case, Hitler was positioned himself as the possessing deity. The final sequence of the film is particularly telling. After a couple more shots of the Cathedral of Light, we get a shot of a dark sky. The sky begins to open, the clouds parting to reveal a heavenly light, and then we crossfade to an image of imposing traditional German architecture. Lacan says, correlatively, the formation of the eye is symbolized in dreams by a fortress or a stadium. With this in mind, the narrative created by the sequence implies that Germany's might is the revelation of heavenly power. Consequently, in that revelation, we expect to see the divine. But here, the divine is Germany itself, the German I, to use Lacan's term. This is a far cry from the idea that one must step outside oneself to experience the sublime. The Cathedral of Light falls into a trap by trying to encompass the sublime within itself. If the sublime is a lightning quick journey away from the comprehension of self, then architecture, not only conceived of but constructed by man, cannot itself be the sublime. Architecture can only be an instrument of revelation. Architecture must point to the sublime, to serve it. And, to serve, as, and as a servant of the sublime, architecture must ask of the universe those questions which have no immediate answer. And a good question is always greater than the most brilliant answer. Leaving the Cathedral of Light, the word sublime seems to be most often associated with a construction of almost overwhelming magnitude, as if the construction itself, in its oppressive size, aims to humble us. But humility born of submission is less than virtuous. I go back to where this all began, to Gaudi's Sagrada Familia. As the structure approaches completion, the tower will be added, making it the world's highest church at 170 meters. But this is exactly one meter lower than the nearby mountain of Montjuic. Gaudi believed his building should not exceed the work of his god. His creation calls attention to the mountain, but doesn't attempt to upstage it. He is trying to be a part of something bigger. Maybe humility should instead, instead rise out of acceptance. Lately, I have been particularly moved by the work of Kengo Kuma, whom I discovered while in Japan. Here is his Prosto Museum. The building was constructed in the system of Chidori, a traditional Japanese toy with interlocking and jointed wooden planks. While I am not particularly familiar with Chidori toys, I am struck by Kuma's idea of rediscovering innocence of early childhood experience through architecture. An innocence devoid of Lacan's eye in which the child is only able to see itself as an extension of everything around it, and the world, is filled with unadulterated wonder. Kuma shows us how to study architecture at full scale. The smallness of Kengo Kuma's houses and tea houses make a thoughtful inquiry into light, materiality, and precision at a scale of inhabitable intimacy, while remaining large enough to study effects that might otherwise be lost in traditional methods of study pushing the ambition and potential of design with a full-scale understanding of the possibilities of the materials in context. Much of Kuma's work operates on the principle of the borrowed view. The very idea of borrowing, borrowing sunlight, for, example, for instance, makes architecture less of a statement and more of an offering. 
We don't possess the light. It is not ours to control. In the end, we couldn't if we wanted to. Light is photon particles. Light is wave. Light is both photons and a wave. Light is speed. Light is heat. Light is all color. Light is seeing. Light reveals time. Light is revelation itself. We know a lot about light, and we have a lot to say, but ultimately it is not up to the architect to decide the light's meaning. All of this brings me back to the beginning of my journey 14 years ago. Dr. Nick Carroll was right. If you are noticing the parts instead of giving yourself over to the whole, I have failed, and there is no potential for the sublime. My research in lighting methodologies and light art can only take me so far, and in many ways have illuminated the gaps in my architectural knowledge. These kinds of theatrical, artificial lighting methods, when applied literally to architecture, especially at night, now read as kitsch or ornament, and not a true working part in the building's whole. Rainer Bannon discusses how LA's water and power building is changed from conventional office building by day into the only gesture of public architecture that matches the style and scale of the city at night, considering light's role not only from outside and into the building, but from within, reaching outward. Lit from within, and integral to the architecture's cohesive power, some buildings invite new meanings and introduce new characters at night. At the end of the Bacchae, Agave accepts her fate with little argument. She exits the drama far more dignified, righteous, and worthy than the jealous, vindictive, and all-too-human God. Moving forward with a mindset of acceptance and awareness, I am developing my own method of designing by question, not by prescribing answers. Like Dan Graham and King Okuma, I hope to offer a mode that doesn't strive to find any specific meaning, thereby allowing meaning to find its way into my design. In my work, I look to foster a symbiotic relationship amongst architecture's many parts, including the power of light. Through the interplay of light and architecture, I want to raise questions of awareness, to hold a mirror to the user and myself, so that we may see ourselves not only as individuals, but as a part of something much bigger than ourselves, suggesting a gate between the self and the unknowable. Thank you.